a nice way to visualize the three-dimensional structure. And then we can recreate sort of a schematic representation of what a toroidal is. Um, so a liquid crystal nano laboratory, the toron has very high free energy near these point defects and there's actually an isotropic core of this point defect and it can, uh, it can attract nanoparticles. So here's a, here's a gold particle that um, gets near the toron and then gets pulled to the center of the toron. And this, is, this is a toron viewed in dark field. So you see a little bit of scattering due to the point defect and then scattering due to the gold. And then in bright field, uh, regular polarizing microscopy, this is what the toron looks like. Uh, this is another toron in a slightly different system, but it's polymerized. And looking in bright field and in dark field, you see the scattering due to the gold localized at the point defect. Here's a schematic kind of showing what, what might be the orientation of this. This is a, a rod-shaped gold particle. Um, so the idea is that the toro is a self-assembly of, of liquid crystal defects, and I can use them to control nanoparticles. And in the past, people have shown scaffolding of plasmonic nanoparticles um, by liquid crystal defects that were stabilized by colloidal inclusions. And here is a system where we don't have a colloidal inclusion, but the defect structure is stabilized by chirality. So it's kind of a neat, neat system to play with. Um, here's, a, here's an example of um, a line defect, and here's a gold nanoparticle localized along the isotropic core of this twist disclination. And here's a toron where one of the point defects has split into a loop of half an integer disclination, and, uh, and it's decorated with nanoparticles. And these are rod shaped gold nanoparticles, so I can have a polarizer to analyze the, the scattered light, and we see that the, the nanoparticles change color, and this is uh, because we're looking at the uh, scattered light due to um, either the longitudinal or transverse uh, surface plasma. So it shows that the, the nanoparticles are also aligned in these defects. Um, so I guess uh, um, that's kind of the idea of what we can how we can use this toron as a way of controlling the nanoparticles. These are interesting nanoparticles. Um, we heard a little bit about blinking. So these nanoparticles are blinking, this fluorescent intermittency. And this is just uh, these nanoparticles spun coat onto a piece of glass. Uh, we're illuminating the, the, the particles, actually in this case with a laser, not a mercury lamp, um, and then viewing them in our uh, CCD. But we can also turn uh, a mirror and send the light to an avalanche photodiode and get these fluorescence trajectories showing uh, you know, periods of off time, periods of on time. <coughs> and, uh, and this histogram is something that I want to draw your attention to. Uh, you see sort of an equal distribution of, of off and on times, uh, or a number of bins that are low, low intensity and number of bins that are high intensity. And so um, my experiment is taking torons uh, that have um, the point defects and having uh, one of these blinking particles in one of the point defects. And so here are two torons, and it's a little tough to see, but if you look at the center, there's some, some bright stuff, and that's actually one of these particles blinking. Um, then I can have a gold particle, which I can bring nearby and have the, the toron sequester this gold particle. And uh, um, hopefully I get to see some sort of difference in the, uh, in the fluorescence. So these two torons are also shown here. This is a gold particle that I can drag using laser tweezers, trapping the distortions around it. And then when I release it, it just gets pulled into this toron. And then the fluorescence, you know, obviously something's different seems to be brighter. And uh, so I'd like to understand why, and uh, uh, NREL's willing to pay me for it. So, <laughs> so this, is, uh, this is what the fluorescence trajectory of one of these uh, blinking cadmium selenide quantum dots looked like in the toron before the gold. And after the gold, um, the histogram has 
dramatically changed. And uh, I'm still thinking about why, trying to come up with a me mechanism. Although, as we heard earlier today, it's a, it could be quite complicated. So backing out the physics is going to be a process. Although, uh, this is just some recent results that I'd like to show. So I guess on a slightly different note, this is, a, this is taking tarons and having voltage reconfigurable self-assembly of the tarons. So there's self-assembly of the defects that make up the taron. But now, when I apply an electric field to a system that has a negative delta epsilon, meaning that the director starts off vertical, and I apply an electric field across the cell, and the, the molecules will want to lay down in plane, um, then I can start to have the tarons go from repulsive interaction, causing them, you know, with lateral confinement to crystallize here, to attractive, and we have these kind of mats of this hexagonal arrangement of tarons. But then I continue to increase the voltage, and we actually get an anisotropic interaction, and we start to get these chains, sort of how a dipole might interact. Um, a two-dimensional dipole. And uh, so I've been trying to understand this. Here, um, <coughs> vertical cross-section surrounding these tarons. We have homeotropic liquid crystal vertically aligned. And then when we apply voltage, we can uh, have the liquid crystal start to lay down in plane due to uh, minimizing the electric term of free energy. And, um, and it also twists because it's a, it's a uh, chiral pneumatic. So it wants to twist. So if we surround the toron by this configuration, we'll see that there has to be a, uh, some sort of defect forming um, in order to um, embed this toron in, in sort of this twisted, uniformly twisted field. And uh, um, I guess understanding that explains why we get this dipolar-like structure and why, why we can switch between, you know, this hexagonal arrangement to chain arrangements. And so uh, I tried to do a little bit of simulation. Now I want to mention I'm an experimentalist, so I don't know very much about simulation, but I was able to write a program to, to relax director, and, uh, and I was able to come up with this, which would be a, a, um, a cross-section XY. It shows this... Uh, Center of the tauron is here, and there's this, uh, this would be the dark spot, which uh, I've been calling it an umbilic defect. So uh, um, then we can describe this as a, a dipole, we can understand why it might start interacting and forming these chains. And uh, um, I guess I have a few other things. I like this because of talking about conflagrational coordinates. There's uh, multiple uh, minima in the ground state. So you can have an unwound, you can have the toron, but you can have other structures. Now I'm going to just skip ahead. I did the simulation to try to achieve this uh, complicated structure of toron connected to itself. And it, it just shows kind of what my simulation was able to do. I didn't achieve the, the, this double toron, but uh, something, something is happening. I believe that I'll be able to get it in the future. So uh, uh, I don't know how I'm doing on time, but uh, I'm almost done. All right. Well, uh, um, this uh, this plot shows how this director is relaxing, and I thought it was uh, it was very interesting because we heard earlier uh, last week from Robin Selinger about uh, defects moving across a lattice, and there's some sort of energy uh, barrier, and so this uh, this MS parameter that I'm plotting here has to do with uh, the functional derivatives of the director relaxing, basically based on the free energy of the system. And so as these high energy defects move from, from grid point to grid point, you see these big jumps in MS. And so I just wanted to show that because it was relevant to what we were talking about earlier. And uh, that's about it. Um, I was able to uh, use topological defects, self-assembly of topological defects, we can generate torons with these vortex beams that we've been hearing about. Um, I can control nanoparticles with torons, uh, and then this leads to a liquid crystal defect nano laboratory. Um, I can also self-assemble the torons, 
and uh, I'm looking at more complex uh, structures, and maybe this is related to knotted fields in the map. So, thank you. So I'm not a chemist, but I know that they do some really fantastic things with the surface chemistry of these nanoparticles. Yeah. So. Anything else? Okay, thank you very much. Surrounded was 
uh, pneumatic liquid crystal. And so the pneumatic liquid crystal will want to be perpendicular to all the sides. So the question is, how does the pneumatic liquid crystal want to deal with the corners, right? So with the sharpness, uh, it has to deal with this with either a bend or slate configuration that results with a plus or minus one fourth winding number. And so as you can see in figure A here, uh, this is the idea behind the simulation that Dan Beller went through. If you assign a minus one fourth winding number here and a plus one fourth winding number here, what would happen? And he runs the simulation and there's no defect here. But then if you have it so that at the bottom, there, the winding numbers for the top and the bottom are the same, then a ring defect has to form in order to make it so that the entire system is topologically neutral charge. And so you can see what I, what I already went through is that there is topological dependence of the colloid on the defect configurations, there's sharpness dependence, and then there's a, a sort of overall shape dependence of the colloid. So in order for us to explore these concepts even more, let's move on to more complicated shapes. And what I propose is that we look to nature for these more complicated shapes. So here are diatoms. Um, diatoms are an algae that are able to produce silica skeletons. And so the silica skeletons are called frustules, and you can see here that there's a diversity of different shapes that are possible that are naturally formed in the sea. So you have like triangles here, and you have cylinders, and when you clean them, they break apart to three different pieces. So this top part and this bottom part are the same, and in the middle part, uh, there's room for the cell, so they're single cellular organisms and they're encased by these silica skeletons. You even have a coffin-shaped diatom here, so it's like five vampire diatoms. I put this in here just to make that joke. But um, what's most fascinating about this is that diatoms can have this sort of like fractal structure. They have layers of uh, pores, and these different layers of pores sort of move fractally. You can see there's it goes to one, to seven, to groups of seven. Um, and so what's an interesting question is if we clean this, treat it such that there's a certain anchoring, whatever anchoring that we want, and put it in the liquid crystal, how will the defect interact with the different layers if it, if it moves from an area of a certain topology to another area of another topology, and so on? And another interesting question is how will defects form for a system where there's it's many genus but finite? So people have played around with aerogels, pneumatic liquid crystals and aerogels, and they have looked at phase transitions and how the presence of the aerogel has affected the phase transition, but they haven't looked at specifically a large but finite genus and how the defects will want to interact with all these different holes, right? Will the gauss bonnet theorem still be obeyed? It's an open question. Um, another uh, biological uh, naturally produced silica is from sponges, so they're sea animals. Um, everything here, this is all not to scale. It was done for like aesthetic purposes. You can see all the different shapes. Um, but they bundle up into shapes like this, and after you clean them, they break out into different pieces. And so what's interesting here is that they have all these different arms, and they form different angles. So this sort of plays around with the idea of like sharpness, having a, like how defects will change depending on the sharpness of the colloid. And yeah, so you can clean this and you can put them in liquid crystal, see what sort of defects can form and ultimately how can they interact. And so also defects are important for self-assembly too. So if they make a certain sort of like defect and the defects are able to interact with each other, it'd be interesting to see how these would assemble with each other inside the system. Oh, and the size ranges here, they can range from like 20 microns to 2,000 microns. Um, so quite large. But Still, if I work with the small one, it would be interesting. Uh, and that's just the general idea. And I wouldn't have learned as much without these people. And uh, yeah, thank, thank you to them, and thank you for your attention. Do you have any hypothesis for what might happen when you put these fractal-like colloids into liquid crystals, for instance? I do not, but it seems when I was talking to Randy about it, he was sort of thinking that maybe interesting knots could be possible, but we don't know. We could run simulations, right, of like layers of different um, 
anthropology is sort of like mimicking that small fractal structure, maybe. Um, but we haven't gone around to that yet, so we're still working on it. Hi everybody, I'm Mike Tuckman. Um, I study liquid crystal phenomena at the uh, Liquid Crystal Materials Research Center at the University of Colorado Boulder. And so we're interested in novel liquid crystal systems and I just want to tell you about one we've been working on recently. Um, there's this really interesting phase of, uh, made of bent core liquid crystals called the B4 phase. And it's this phase of twisted nanofilaments. And so we're interested in uh, what happens when you mix these, uh, this phase of uh, nanofilaments that form this sort of uh, nanoporous medium. And you mix them with power liquid crystals. And we actually find some pretty interesting optical effects. Um, so, we begin with Novo, which is an eight chiral bent core liquid crystal, it's sort of shaped like a banana, banana before, or banana uh, bent core liquid crystal phase. We'll see the, the terms being thrown around. Um, and it forms the B4 phase, which is actually a chiral phase of helical nanofilaments. And you can see an example of one here and a free fracture uh, transmission electron micrograph of some of them over here. Um, so they nucleate with random handedness. Um, to form mesoscale porous domains with twisted boundary conditions. And so you can see sort of how they form from this schematic here. We start with this bent core mesogen, and when they form a, a, layered, stru a layered and tilted structure, they become spontaneously chiral. Um, so, and when this, uh, when the molecules themselves twist out of plane, they can, they, there's this in layer mismatch, which is uh, which drives this local preference for saddle splay, which gives us these helical nanofilaments. So here I just want to point out that the nanofilaments are uh, 30 nanometers in width, and there's not much variation from that, that length, or that, that diameter. And you can see clearly the layer edges in the, uh, in the TEM images. So this is an overview of the system that we're studying here. We have this. Uh, when the B4 phase forms, we get this porous chiral host. So we have left-handed and right-handed helical nanofilaments, and these are, uh, the entire domains are left-handed and right-handed. And then we get these left-handed and right-handed twisted boundaries. So these, the twists on the boundaries will be different depending on the handedness of the domain itself. So then when we mix chiral liquid crystals in here, we get these diastereomeric domains. We get domains in which there's a liquid crystal of one handedness, and then domains of different, hand, uh, different handednesses. And then when these liquid crystals form a chiralomatic phase, they actually become a supermolecular diastereomeric domain. And so to denote that, uh, we have this notation here, which a lot of stereochemists uh, like to use, or you like to use something like this, where one letter refers to the handedness of the, in this case, if we we're talking about the RR domain, the, uh, it refers to right-handed helical nanofilament domain and right-handed liquid crystals. And then in the, this LR domain, we have left-handed helical nanofilaments and right-handed liquid crystals. So I'll be only, I'll, I'll be only focusing on right-handed uh, liquid crystals just for simplicity here. 
So these are the molecules we use. And it's important to note that uh, the B4 phase forms at a much higher temperature than uh, the molecules that we study. And uh, we want that to be the case because we want this to form directly out of the isotropic phase um, so that this, this superstructure can be formed and then the uh, guest material here, 705 star, can go through its own phases. Um, its own phases, and so these are the important temperatures. So here's an example of what we see. We have a, uh, an RR domain and an LR domain. You can see they, they exhibit different optical properties. Um, they nucleate from a point and they grow radially outward. And so these are helical nanofilaments just growing radially outwards. And their growth is only truncated by the growth of other domains. Um, the, so we measured the birefringence. Of the, of the helical nanofilament systems by uh, referring to n parallel and n perpendicular. <coughs> and there's um, no limit to how large you can get them to grow, actually, if you're careful enough. You can get them to grow extremely large and actually pretty small, too. So that's controllable. So this is what we see when we see. I guess I'll have to skip it. I had a pretty impressive looking video where um, there was a temperature sequence and then you could see the colors change and there was these different optical properties in the left and right hand domain. And here's um, a few images from that so you can see some snapshots. It's not as impressive, but you can get the idea. So in the uh, semantic phase, you can see they're more or less the same color, although you can still see a difference. And then right at the nomadic to semantic transition, this, uh, the one domain here, I believe it was the our, our domain becomes completely dark, well, whereas the other one is uh, very bright. So you can see there's some, some optical phenomenon that's going on that uh, we, we find very interesting. This is what we wanted to study. It was just what we found pretty interesting here. And then there's this op opposite, or this uh, different optical properties in the nomadic phase as well. So in order to study a little more quantitatively, we took uh, some intensity measurements and drew up this fire fringes plot here. And um, we measure the birefringence with a compensator, so we can tell the sign of birefringence. And actually, in the nomadic phase here, um, they have the, each of the domains has they have opposite handedness, or sorry, they have opposite birefringences from each other. So understanding that was something that uh, we wanted to pursue. And you can see these steps here. Um, we attribute those to the optical rotation caused by the. Um, twist structure of the helical nanofilaments. So we'll never measure zero intensity, but we can measure, uh, but the contributed intens intensity from the optical rotation is very small. So here's a model of, uh, of what's going on in uh, the nomadic phase. You basically see uh, in this side view, you can see pretty nicely what's going on. So the, the rod-like molecules will um, tend to absorb along the layer edges of the helical nanofilaments. So we get these, uh, these two configurations where we have right-handed lipid crystals in uh, right-handed power nematic lipid crystals in each of these left and right-handed helical nanofilament domains. And so they twist with their preferred handedness, in this case right-handed, and then we get opposite uh, birefringences in each of the two domains. So in this case you can see it's, tw it's twisting this way and on average it has to, or on average it's contributing uh, positive birefringence here, sorry, contributing a negative birefringence here and positive one here. So this gives us these optical, or these opposite signs of birefringence. So to understand what's going on in the, uh, when the image goes completely dark here, um, we turn to freeze fracture. So we wanted to study what, what the molecular configuration was of the, uh, when the guest material was in a semantic phase. <laughs> in the semantic phase. So this is what we found. So on the left, here's for comparison, um, meet Novo. Novo with no, the helical nanofilaments with no mixtures, uh, with nothing else mixed with it. And here's one where uh, 705 star, that guess material, is mixed with the Novo. So you can see this 
screw the screw like uh, uh, the screw like behavior or what looks like the, uh, the screw shape of the helical nanofilament seems to be enhanced when um, the seven of five stars in symmetric phase. Um, and you can see also that the thickness varies across each of these helical nanofilaments. So in this case, we believe that um, the guest mectic layers are wrapping on the surface normal of the helical nanofilaments and actually conformally wrapping around the, the helical nanofilaments. So that gives that enhanced screw-like uh, texture. And actually, we found something else, too, a little less rare, but very, very thick helical nanofilaments with no visible layer edges. And so in this case, we believe that the same thing is happening as in this figure C here. Um, but actually, the guest layers are beginning to wrap around the exposed layer edges of the helical nanofilaments. So you can see here, like as, as the layers grow, uh, pile up, they actually grow over the layer edges until you get something that's shaped sort of like a cigar with this remnant uh, helical ripple on the outside. So we can see that here. And I'd like to note, uh, it's important to note that both of these confirmations correspond to increasingly negative birefringence. So this, this basically will explain pretty well the, um, uh, the birefringence plot that we saw earlier. So to conclude, um, we find that the B4 phase makes an excellent sensor of liquid crystal chirality, and it acts in the bulk as a mesoscale of porous chiral host with twisted boundary condition. And so for comparison, here's, here's the intensity plot that we found for the chiral guess, the one I just showed, and here's one with an A chiral guess where the difference in the intensity is minimal and optically you can't tell the difference, whereas here we get this interesting optical properties. So. And that's it. Thank you. So have you or anybody done experiments where you form the B4 phase in the presence of the chiral, the same chiral dopants, to bias the population of right or left-handed, say? Is it possible to do that? Um, as far as I understand, I, I don't think it is because there's, um, I might not have mentioned this actually, but the B4 phase really loves to phase separate right. from anything. So, um, uh, we haven't tried using like a high temperature uh, chiralomatic. Yeah, or cast somehow solution faster or somehow. Yeah, no, I believe. Uh, okay. Uh, I don't think so. I think phase separates so strongly that, you know, affects them. Like, you know, there are ways to get homochiral like, uh -huh. samples, for instance, by biasing it by putting a chiral sensor on it or right. other ways, but right. I don't think that way. Not by doping with other molecules. Not by doping with, an ex like, with a the guest And then our final um, human speaking question is Alice. Uh, um, I won't be talking about liquid crystals, but uh, I'll be talking about the um, whether birds might exploit quantum effects to migrate. Before I get to my research, I thought I'd give you a history of um, the theory of bird migration just so that uh, quantum migration sounds less preposterous. So, um, <laughs> mentions of first wanderings about bird migration pop up a lot in religious texts, but there's never really any conclusions, just that the birds moved to the God of Finger. The first person to really actually um, try and come up with a theory about bird migration was Aristotle, 
because there were birds in Greece called red starts, and they migrated south in the winter, and then robins migrated from further north to Greece in winter, he concluded that red starts turned into robins. And then in the 1400s, Archbishop Magnus, because before they migrate, uh, birds will collect on water edges to eat insects and fatten up, he decided that uh, birds went uh, underwater when they migrated, and that's actually a picture of them fishing swallows out of the lake. <laughs> then uh, Charles Morton, because birds, uh, this is now the 1600s, because birds collected on church spires, he concluded that they migrated to the moon to be closer to God. And the first kind of scientific theories started when the, in the 1700s, 1800s with the methods such as bird banding where birds could be tracked. But I'm interested in 1978 in the, where Klaus Schulten came up with the radical well, pair mechanism to explain and bird migration. Okay, so how do birds do it? Well, they do it in various ways. They memorize certain landmark, landmarks, they use the sun and the moon as compasses, but I'm interested in how they use the Earth's magnetic field. There are two main theories. The one is that they have ferromagnetic crystals in their beaks that align themselves in the magnetic field, but they did an experiment where they cut the nerve from the beak to the um, brain and the birds it still migrate. So the bird's eye view, which is a radical pair mechanism, which is what, which is what I'm studying, is currently, I'd say, probably the leading theory. Um, and it suggests that there's a biological molecule in the bird's eye that allows for the creation of this radical pair, and the dynamics are affected by the magnetic field. This allows the bird to see where it is in the magnetic field. So, how does the radical pair work? Well, this is the simple version. It's a photon-induced excitation of an electron in the donor molecule. And um, so now you have two unpaired, spatially separated, but spinning correlated electrons and they start out in a, a singlet state um, and then their interactions because each electron is now surrounded by other nuclei um, and it's in the magnetic field and these interactions cause a singlet triplet mixing conversion. And they're not really sure how this translates to a chemical signature but they think that um, the difference and I'll, I'll show you later an artist's impression of what might, might, might be happening. They think that the singlet and triplets and states form different chemical products which the bird can then interpret. And this is how it sees, sees where it's going. In reality, it's, it's far more complicated. Cryptochrome, cryptochrome is the molecule that they think this radical pair is happening in. Um, and they don't, although cryptochrome is quite well understood in plants, it's not that well understood yet in, um, in animals. So I'm going to have to move fairly fast, otherwise I'm not going to finish. Um, evidence in support of the radical pair is that it's light dependent, it needs um, an it undamaged visual system. Um, it gives results for weak fields. The Earth's magnetic field is 47 micrometers. Um, it's an inclination compass, so it doesn't matter if the poles are swapped, that's still fine, but it is disrupted by um, an oscillating radio frequency magnetic field. So these are just two diagrams. Uh, you've seen lots of really complicated um, experiments and experimental setups. I'm afraid my, my, my experiment, well, the experiments in this field are far, far more rudimentary. The birds, the birds, bird, migrating birds still display um, migratory behavior even if they're in cages. So Germans have a word for it, it's called Zulu, means migratory restlessness or pulling. So they hop and they flutter in the direction they should be flying. So they kind of put them in cages with carbon paper and then they measure the number of scratches in certain directions. So that top one is just to show you the light dependence of the, of the behavior, and it actually turns out it's in the right eye. Um, you'll see when they come to the left eye, the birds are uh, fine, when they come to the right eye, the birds are disoriented. The low picture is what I was saying before, and um, how does this translate into a chemical signature? Well, they think that if it's in a triplet state, then the bird gets a blind spot, so it gets kind of a darkening of its vision, which directs it to fly in a certain direction. Um, okay, so my research is basically just modeling, modeling the system to try and reproduce the results such, such as the radical pair lifetime that they're getting experimentally. I'll start with the spin Hamiltonian, but I'm only looking at the Zeeman effect and the hyperfine, that's the magnetic field and the surrounding nuclei because of spatial separation. I'm neglecting all the, the last three terms. So that's what my um, system Hamiltonian looks like. 
This is the magnetic field part, which is for two electrons, and this is the hyperfine. That's a hyperfine coupling constant, and it's an anisotropic, which is these are the two um, the hyperfine coupling tensors. I'm going to go through the maths quite fast, and I'm going to run out of time. Don't pay that much attention to this, it's just diagonalizing the Hamiltonian to make the next steps um, easier to do mathematically. So now the system evolution, because it's, uh, it's not an isolated quantum system, it's interacting with its environment, I have to put it in a bath, in a thermal bath, and allow it to dissipate, so that's just the form of the thermal bath and the um, interaction Hamiltonian can then be written by that, like, like this. Now, basically what you need to take away from this slide is that these, this mixing between singlet and, tri and triplet is governed by certain um, transitions. So what these, v, these Vs are, they're transition operators. They just they measure the transition and they have corresponding transition frequencies. Where this, so this is dissipation now. And this, where your transition frequency is zero, is measuring the decoherence in the system. And you'll see that the, the important thing to note on this slide you'll see it in my last slide why, is that the transition frequencies are written in terms of the magnetic field and the hyperfine coupling constant. So basically all the maths leads to finding this master equation which tells me the dynamics of the, of the system. Here is your decoherence part, this is your dissipation part, these are rates of dissipation, and, and this shows the, the stimulated, this will show the, the stimulated, uh, stimu Stimulated dissipation. So then, solving the master equation, we tried um, to find an exact or to, to solve analytically, but ended up doing numerically because you know these parameters of the hyperfine and the um, and the magnetic field. You can solve for these transition frequencies, and these results now are the oldish results. Um, so it was just checking see what happened when we increased the number of nuclei surrounding that. So trying to get some sense of what this cryptochrome looks like, whether the behavior changes if you have one nucleus or two nuclei. And I'm not going to interpret them too much because they've changed slightly. I was using rates, dissipation rates from experimental literature and now finally managed to actually derive them from scratch and the results look slightly better. But uh, one interesting thing that I don't have a conclusion yet, but what I do have is uh, an interesting, um, okay, so not this one, an interesting recent experimental development where about three, or about a month ago now, they just they've been doing tests for seven years in the Oldenburg, which um, revealed that birds are disrupted by uh, anthropogenic, man-made radio frequency electromagnetic. Um, radiation in the kilohertz to megahertz range, um, which would make sense because um, because as I showed you, those, those transition frequencies, that stimulated ones, they, they depend on the number of photons at that frequency in the bath. Now if you increase the number of, and they're all radio frequency transitions, so if you increase the number of radio frequency transitions, then you're going to increase the number of, um, you're going to increase the dissipation and you're going to shrink the lifetime of the radical pet and then the bird wouldn't be able to, to migrate. So it seems to make sense that, that this would, this, that radio frequency radiation would disrupt the birds. So that's a fairly exciting, for me at least, development. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> starts killing birds because they are not able to detect it. Plus, it starts making a lot of, let's say, un undesired field, which can cause a you know, problem for planes or any other flying item. So I was wondering how would, let's say, wind turbines, which gonna be installed in really high level and generate all these noises, impact on this migration? 
because um, soon they're gonna be all over the place. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not really sure how much difference with they different. Is it? The previous like uh, in the same range of frequency oh, really? because of like the equipment which they have out there, so they start generating like noises. Let's say we call disturbance or harmonics up to maybe four to 40 times of the basic frequency, which is 50 or 60, which can be more than like kilohertz plus all the equipment, like the power electronic itself, because of like <coughs> very high frequency switching, it will start pre producing, let's say, we call it like radio, like uh, frequency interference. So that's one of the things that, you know, well, if it's in the red, if it's in that range, then yeah, it'll have the same effect as. Yeah, that, I mean, that's it doesn't one. damage them when they remove them from the, the cities they find. I mean, like, I mean like that's one also one of the reasons, like they put the, like the safety code, so the wind turbines are not allowed to be in a, like a, in a, inside the city or anywhere that people are living in urban area because of the you know this frequency that they generate. Well, but, I'll have a look at that. Thank you. Thanks.